Okay, this is the fault mechanics lecture from our Geology 310 Structural Geology class. And so here in this, we talked about um, how earth, the earthquake cycle has two phases. There's a interseismic cycle where we load up the, the crust because the fault is blocked and we may deform the blocks around it, like in this case of uh, first subduction zone, we're lifting up the coast at the sea and subsiding in the interior. But then in the earthquake, boom, the uh, there's this elastic rebound that occurs and we, we see that the uh, opposite sort of a balance occurs where we balance out what accumulated during the co-seismic phase. So this is used a lot of times for the study of earthquake recurrence on subduction zones, like in Cascadia of the Pacific Northwest, or for example, in uh, Indonesia. So here's a simple model for an earthquake. We have a spring and a slider. In this case, we pull and the hand moves steadily, but the earthquake has to, or the slider has to uh, have some stress increase along its base until it can slip. So when we talk about faults, we're really talking about friction, and that's the ratio between the normal force applied to the fault surface and the shear force applied to it. So in this experiment, you see the geology students are putting more and more rocks on this model, and that means adding more and more vertical or normal stress. And then they'll pull with the little fish, fish weighing scale, and they see how much stress they have to uh, apply to get the thing to move. And so they can make a plot like this one, where we have a shear force that's applied to make it move versus the normal force that's holding it together. And we see as we increase normal force, it takes more and more shear force to get the thing to move. And it's this ratio that uh, defines the slope of the line, and that's friction. So this, in real uh, rocks in the laboratory, was explored by a U.S. Geological Survey scientist named Jim Byerly, and this was named in the end after him because it was so important. And here we can see in normal stress versus shear stress that at low stresses, it's a linear relationship with a uh, slope of 0.85, that's the friction coefficient. At larger stresses, it becomes slightly lower friction coefficient, but it has a y-intercept, which is called the cohesion. So here we have it, um, as we drew on the board, here's the notes. Everything below that line of the uh, failure line is stable. Everything above is unstable. Slope of the line is Ratio of shear to normal stress. That's also the has an angle is an angle phi, and the ratio of the two is tan phi, or sometimes called the coefficient of internal friction mu. And we call this the Coulomb law of failure. We can see that in this sandbox experiment, as we crank up the the stress on the reverse faulting side, as we move the baffle to the right we decrease the stress on the left. The vertical stress is the same in both cases and magnitude, but the it becomes sigma one on the left and it becomes sigma three on the right because it's the least stress on the right and the most stress on the left. And on the left, because we move the baffle over, we decrease that horizontal stress, making it sigma three and a normal fault plane. In contrast, on the right, we increase the, the horizontal stress. So sigma one becomes horizontal and we get a reverse fault. We can continue this along so the fault systems evolve. In the more circle view on the left, we start at, or on the right, we start at a single point where sigma one equals sigma three, and for the normal faulting case, we just pull sigma three to the left, so we're decreasing its magnitude. This means the circle will increase in radius until it would hit that failure line. In other words, one particular orientation of fault in the volume has just hit the failure. We can do the same thing 
with the reverse faulting case, this actually takes more stress. We have to keep the vertical stress constant and become sigma 3. Push on the side, which basically increases sigma 1. The circle becomes larger. And again, we hit an optimal orientation of fault that will fail. So we can draw this out. And what's useful is that there's a triangle that's defined by this intersection of the failure line with the zero shear stress line, or one of the axes. And so that's point A. B is the tangent intersection between the radius of the Moore circle and the Coulomb failure line. And C is the center of the Moore circle. So that there's three angles, right angle for the tangent between the radius and that tangent line. Uh, phi, the angle of internal friction, and then gamma, which is just uh, the complement of two theta. So we can go through our basic trig and come up with a relationship that says that if the, uh, the friction, as determined by Barley, is, Barley is 0.6, when we go through and take the arctan, we can find out that phi would be 31 degrees. So this is a material property could change, but that's what we we interpret from his work. So then you go through that triangular relationship. So we can say that, well, gamma would be 59 degrees. And then if we solve for theta, then it would be 60.5. So basic arithmetic, just rearranging these equations. And then if you look at that, um, uh, that triangle and this relationship with gamma, you can prove that theta then is equal to 45 plus phi over 2. So what's the optimum dip? Let's take a reverse fault. So we know in this case, sigma 1 is horizontal. And we know that the normal to this fault plane the angle between it and sigma 1 is theta. So by alternating interior angles, we can show that uh, this angle here in the inside of this triangle is also theta. So with uh, 90 degrees for the relationship between the normal and the fault plane and the dip, then we can just do the basic math here to find out that the optimal dip for the fault is about 30 degrees. That's for a reverse fault. Now for a normal fault, it's uh, we can uh, take a dip uh, to the left. And in this case, then uh, sigma 1 is vertical because it's a normal fault. So we go straight down. But then the normal to the fault is here. So uh, theta is over to that. And so in this case, um, we can show that uh, if you have this triangle here, and that is inside the triangle that contains the fault plane and the normal, we can show that the dip is basically equal to that, that angle between the single one and the normal. So the dip equals theta equals 60.5. So that's the proof of why well-behaved or well-oriented reverse faults dip about 30 degrees and why well-behaved normal faults dip about 60 degrees. So that's why then when we look at this drawing from Andersonian faulting theory, we can see these relatively lower dips for the reverse faults, relatively higher dips for the uh, normal faults, and why we see it shows 60 degree dip and 30 degree dip. So it's the geometric proof for why those numbers are there. And then in the strike slip case, you could determine the strike of the optimally oriented strike slip fault if you knew the orientation of sigma 1. So let's go back to our squid lake example. If you remember from uh, before, so we have this lake, there's two faults near it. One dips at about 85 degrees, the other dips at 45. Sigma 1 is horizontal at 100 MPa. Sigma 3 is vertical at 50, so it's reverse faulting condition. So if we look at these in the Moore circle, but we've added our failure line here, assuming a friction of, of 0 0.6, we can see that the first fault that has the 85 degree dip, if you look at this relationship here, here's the fault. And uh, so then the angle between sigma 1, which is horizontal, and that normal is only 5 degrees. So what we can see is then uh, when we do the math with our uh, stress equations, most of the stress is 
in the normal traction, 99.62, and the shear is just quite small. And then when you look at it on the Mohr circle, you see it's sitting way over here, so far away from that failure line, very stable. Now, when you look at the 45 degree dipping fault, there's more normal traction and also, uh, or there's less normal traction, more shear, but still it's far away from the failure plane. So neither of these are optimally oriented, nor is the stress large enough to drive failure. So let's take an optimally oriented fault where we know theta is 61 degrees. So this is the reverse fault. So it's about 30 degree dip as shown here. So just in this case, this is our best ratio of sigma n and sigma s, uh, but it's still sitting down in our stable field. So there's no way, there's no fault that can fail under these stress conditions. We need to increase the driving stress. We need to uh, pump up sigma 1 or decrease sigma 3 or change the pore pressure. So let's look at increasing sigma 1 in this little movie. So here's the same thing what we just were looking at with our optimally oriented fault. But here we're increasing the sigma 1. So we're just pushing harder on the side. You see that sigma 3 is the same at 50 MPA. But you can see that as we crank it up, there's a, one of those faults and that optimal orientation will finally fail. But, and even if we pump it up more, we have a large, there's the optimal orientation. Right at about 160 MPA, we get a good uh, potential for failure. Let's watch that one more time. There's our optimal situation. It's still theta 61. It's the very first orientation of fault that will fail, but it takes us pumping up the uh, tectonic stress, the horizontal stress, sigma 1, to about 160 MPA. So what would it take to make one of the existing faults fail? Well, it turns out the one to choose, the 45 is the closer to failure as we saw before, but in order to cross the, the failure line, to push that fault up into the unstable zone, we need to push sigma 1 to 205 megapascals. So you need to add even more stress to get one of those faults to fail. So here's just a general view of, of how failure works. We can see that in tension, over here on the left side, we can um, you know, break something by just pulling on it hard enough with the normal um, traction being uh, negative or tensile. The other thing we can do, and then in this middle zone here, we have the Coulomb failure envelope. So that's just frictional behavior. Faults are uh, behaving as simple frictional interfaces. And then as the stresses get very high, then uh, we basically kind of have more plastic behavior. And so that's this von Mises transition. So here's an, another uh, way to get the faults to fail under lower driving stresses, and that's to increase the pore pressure. And so here's the, the situation. If we look at fold and thrust belts, we can see that a lot of times the many of the faults are pretty low dips. They're closer to maybe 10 degrees, not the optimal 30. Some of the ramps might go up to about 30 degrees, but the uh, many of the other portions of the faults are lower dips. So how, how can they they slip? So the idea comes from this experiment that's shown kind of in a funny way in this cartoon above where these two scientists, structural geologists named Hubbard and Ruby, who were thinking about this problem, and they were having these cold beverages in these cans, and they were thinking, and they said, well, why don't we put one in the freezer? So then they got a window out of um, from its uh, area in the wall, and they put it on the the, the table here. 
And what they did is they measured the angle at which it would start to fail or start to move this can that they flipped upside down. And so the one can that the one of them was using um, took a pretty steep angle to get it to move. So then they thought, oh, that's interesting. So then they took in panel E, they got into the freezer and they got one of the cans, they flipped it upside down and then it moved on a lot much lower angle. You might ask yourself, well, why is that? The answer is that the air was cold that was inside that empty can. And then as the can and the air warmed up, the pressure increased and it was able to carry more of the weight of the can. And so in other words, the, the pressure, poor pressure, um, it decreases the normal stress. And so then we need less shear stress to get the thing to move. So then you see funny, they're playing, playing this uh, experiment more and more in the final uh, panel. So in the more circle view, what it is, is we say, well, we start off with the more circle sitting way over here in the stability zone, but the effect of the pore pressure is to diminish the normal stress everywhere. But it doesn't affect the shear stress because it's just like that air pressure lifting up the can. And so what we call is we have effective normal stress, which is sigma 1 minus PF for the pore pressure equals sigma 1 star. And so all that does, is you sub, it's also subtracted from sigma 3. The effective sigma 3 is sigma 3 minus PF. So what happens is we just slide the whole circle to the left, and bam, we can uh, find some orientation, some faults that are made close to failure. So here it is in the case of Squid Lake with that, for, that uh, optimal orientation of fault. You could also do it with one of the other ones. But it's sitting here stable. So instead of pumping up the, the uh, normal, uh, the, the sigma 1, we can just uh, increase the pore pressure, which means that the effectively S1 and S3, sigma 1 and sigma 3, go down by, 70, by 25 MPa each. And uh, bam, it hits the failure. So, and that's maybe more of the risk in this contrived example from Squid Lake because the the lake is there, and so the lake pore pressure, the water from the lake could increase the pore pressure near one of those faults. And so that would be the potential hazard. And that's an example then from uh, the U.S. and uh, induced seismicity which we see is largely caused by increases in pore pressure. So we talked about this some when we talked about hydrofracking. This is a map of the U.S. where there's various um, solid colors that show uh, various activities, oil and gas extraction and so forth. But what we start to see is in the eastern North America, and this is even more active since uh, I made this slide, there's more and more activity like wastewater injection, for example, in uh, Eastern Ohio, that's uh, wastewater that comes from hydrofracking and other oil production uh, be behaviors. And so here's a classic example uh, from what was called the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. So it was a facility near Denver in the 1960s where they were trying to get rid of, rid of some waste. And so this plot shows years, 1960s, 62, 63, 64, 65 and millions of gallons a month that were injected. And what they could show was that, um, and as they injected the waste, we saw more and more earthquakes each month. So that's what the lower plot showed. For a little while, 1963, 64, they decreased their, or they did no fluid injection, and you see the seismicity dropped. Then they got back into it, 64, 65, and the seismicity went way up. So it's a clear association between this fluid injection and earthquakes. And so this is a, a article that came from the New York Times a year or so ago from Youngstown, Ohio. And there was a couple of earthquakes that occurred there. And you see these two trucks. And in March 17, these two minor earthquakes occurred near Youngstown. And this uh, person, Steve Morris, he said, it felt like someone's kicking in the door. It scared the stuffing out of me. These are small earthquakes, magnitude 2.7. And nine quakes in, in California might be no big deal, but in Ohio, it's a big deal. And so what they found was that the earthquakes, the epicenters were near a 9,000 foot deep well, 
in Youngstown. At the well, a local company has been disposing of brine and other liquids from natural gas wells, millions of gallons of waste from hydraulic fracturing. So this is the problem is not exactly hydraulic fracturing, but the disposal of the waste, which a lot of times injected into the ground, not as high pressure as the hydraulic fracturing, but much higher volume in the end. So that's the story of fault mechanics.